Hello YouTube and welcome back into another Dare to Game video. Today we will be discussing Cyberpunk 2077. As you should know based on the title and the thumbnail, this is my 120-ish hour review. Of course that number is just my time played on Steam and doesn't reflect any time on any of the other systems that I've sampled, and is just where I am at when starting out this review. Given that it will likely take me several days to complete this review, that number is of course subject to change. But in any case, I have played the game long enough, in my opinion, to form a full and complete opinion of this game for review purposes. So let's dive on in and get to reviewing. I will do my level best to avoid any major story spoilers, but to explain some things there may be minor spoilers even if I try my best, so watch with care. As a little background information, I have completed two full playthroughs and am on my third at the time of making this review. My first playthrough was as a male nomad, my second was as a female corpo, and my third is as a male street kid. In my first uh, playthrough, I made a point to not fast travel at all, so I could experience as much of the world and every detail as possible. And in both playthroughs, I did every single side mission and gig that was available to me at any given time. So I believe I've experienced what this game has to offer. Now, my third playthrough is testing what can be done, if there are different outcomes for specific different choices and so on. So I expect this third playthrough to go on for much longer than the first two. In any case, I think I am capable of actually reviewing the game. Unlike most of the quote games journalists out there who played it for 10 hours or less before rushing out their myopic reviews as fast as possible. Since this game is meant to be a story driven RPG, we will start with story. As many people, myself included, find this area to be one of, if not the most important areas of focus for a game such as this. Cyberpunk 2077 has approximately 30 main story missions with the first one being different depending on the background that you check, and the last two or three depending on the ending path that you reach based on decisions made during the game. The story drives you forward by placing artificial stakes on you, much like how The Witcher 3 would remind you that Ciri needed to be found as soon as possible. And just like The Witcher 3, there isn't any actual consequence for not going through the main story quickly. This is, however, a necessity as there is no end game in Cyberpunk 2077. There is a point of no return, and after whatever ending path you take, you will revert to this point. This allows you to do side missions, romance people, buy stuff, level up, and explore Night City and the Badlands for as long as you want. I personally do not like this style of storytelling, as I prefer a resolution option. I can't explain exactly what I'm talking about here without spoiling the story, but in simple terms, I prefer a game that allows me to play on after my character has resolved the major issue, and not have it looming over my head while I try to enjoy side content. The quality of the story itself is actually not bad. I found it to be very immersive, and offer enough options and pathway choices to make each playthrough feel unique, while also making sense in the world. Never did I find myself in a situation that I couldn't believe that my V would be in based on what he or she said or did during the story. The story is not very long, but when properly supplemented with the appropriate side missions needed to build up a relationship with various characters, it does a good job of making the player feel connected to the story, as well as the people in it. There is actually a moment in my second playthrough where the game actually made me feel an emotion. And to be quite honest, that's pretty rare these days, so I gotta give the game props for that. There are also about 83 side missions that you can unlock throughout the game depending on your gender, background, and the choices that you make. These range from full-blown multi-set storylines to missions where you bust into a building to get someone out. The vast majority of these missions are, of course, the latter. There are a few standout arcs, such as the romance chains, that are very memorable and make a big difference in the game. In my opinion, the devs did a pretty good job of making these missions important, which I believe is crucial to good side content. Cyberpunk handles side missions as all good games should. You do not need to do them to complete the game, but if you do them, you will experience a more coherent story and get a better ending. Aside from the material gains of doing these extra missions, most of the character growth and relationship building in the game comes from the side missions, so I definitely recommend doing them all if you really want to enjoy the game. Finally, there are approximately 86 gigs. These are another type of side content in Cyberpunk 2077. They act a lot like the Witcher contracts in The Witcher 3. They are generally one-stop shops where you complete a simple straightforward task and collect a small amount of money as a reward. They don't really add anything to the story and rarely contain any story within them. Even the two of them that have several different gigs all tied together don't really change the outcome of your game in any way. They just result in a reward of some sort. In one case a car and in the other a gun. Neither of them is particularly Particularly special and didn't feature in my playthroughs after completing them. They are certainly not 
the worst side content I've ever completed, but in future playthroughs it is entirely possible that I will do very few of them unless I'm grinding for money or XP, as they don't stand out much more than that. And while we're on the topic of story, I'm going to bundle in game length, as it is very closely tied with the story. Most people report the game taking approximately 15 to 25 hours to complete. Most of the variation seems to be from how much side content you engage in. Honestly, that is probably pretty accurate. Of course, it depends how you play the game. If you bum rush the main story and do the bare minimum side content and go with the default ending, you could honestly probably finish the game in 5 hours, or maybe less. I'm sure there is already a speedrunner or two out there trying to answer that very question. However, if you explore the world and do the side content, and actually let the conversations play out so that you are really experiencing the story, it is likely closer to the 25 to 30 hour mark. To be fair, that is not an extraordinarily long game when you consider a few other open world RPGs that we've seen over the last five or six years. Just as a few comparisons, the average playthrough of Kingdom Come Deliverance takes about 40 hours to complete. Fallout 4 takes roughly 60 hours, and The Witcher 3 takes about 70 hours. All of these numbers are via How Long to Beat. It's a website where you can look at a bunch of different games. It's it's decent if you're interested in how long it takes people to beat games, I guess. Uh, and those numbers are drawn from player averages that assume the main story plus around 40% of side content available. It should also be noted that each of these games goes well over 100 hours if the player intends to complete every scrap of content in the game. Given that this is the way I play these games, and have played each of them, I can confirm that these numbers are actually pretty accurate. So, as I will be rating everything in this game on a scale of 1 to 10, with 1 being the worst and 10 being the best, I would give the main story quality a 7 out of 10. I would give the side story quality a 6 out of 10, and I would give the game length a 5 out of 10. So my average for the story is 6 out of 10. So for the second section I'm going to be discussing, it's going to be gameplay. In the simplest terms, if I were to describe this game to someone else, I would have to compare it to Grand Theft Auto with a very small amount of The Witcher, which makes sense given that the devs are who they are and the setting is what it is. Of course, I would then break down each area. The gunplay is much, much better than Grand Theft Auto, but the driving and car customization is nothing compared to Grand Theft Auto. And every area where we get a little bit of that Witcher magic is only a shade in comparison. The swordplay and fighting is very simplified, and averts to a simple hack and slash system that while being enjoyable enough for a while, eventually devolves into nothing special. Whereas with games like The Witcher 3 or Shadow of War or Kingdom Come Deliverance, the combat gets more interesting as you go, in this game, in my opinion, it gets progressively more lackluster as the game proceeds. The cars in this game suffer from the same physics problems that the rest of the world enjoys. That being wild inconsistency. This makes it nearly impossible to master the driving system in Cyberpunk 2077. Sometimes you'll be able to corner perfectly by feathering the gas as you go around the corner. Other times, applying the same method, you will overshoot, drift 30 feet sideways, overcorrecting, and killing three civilians. The cars simulate a tight handling system by appearing reactive, but if you try to navigate the dense streets of at anything above 40 miles per hour, you're going to quickly realize the vehicles are drifty as hell, and the margin for error is huge. It's like when you hop up on Grandpa's track and start to drive. You can turn the wheel halfway around before it actually starts to do anything. That's driving in this game. In addition to that, the vehicles don't seem to know when they should explode, throw you off, or plow through what they hit like a tank. I've had times where I crash my motorcycle into an oncoming car, and ramp the car off my bike and send it flying 100 feet in the air behind me. I've also had times where I run into the side of a car and explode. Or once, when I was stepping my motorcycle backwards, I hit a pedestrian and did a backflip off my bike. Needless to say, the vehicles in this game can be very fun to use, but the inconsistencies in the game physics leave most people scratching their heads. The gunplay is good, not great. The shots feel accurate, especially if you're using a mouse, but I found that if I use a controller, which I prefer to do for games like this, it is very drifty and makes it super difficult to shoot anyone more than 20 feet in front of me, because my cursor will randomly drift to the side. This also makes quick hacking a nightmare and has really prevented me from being as stealthy as I would like to in a game like this. The recoil on the guns is also a bit much, 
As someone who has a lot of real life experience using pretty much every type of firearm, I can tell you that the amount of recoil we are experiencing makes little to no sense. You're playing as a hardened and experienced mercenary with cybernetic enhancements, yet when they shoot small caliber handguns, the muzzle flip makes it look like a 12 year old shooting a snub nose 44 Magnum, and anything more than short bursts with the automatic weapons leaves the spray pattern looking like a Jackson Pollock painting. There are perks and attachments to limit this, but it is definitely a ridiculous starting point. That aside, gun animations and sounds are all very good. I would say perhaps the best I've seen in any modern game. As far as another beef I have with the way guns work, dismemberment in this game sucks. I know that this is not a huge deal, as there are lots of great games out there that don't feature dismemberment systems, such as Kingdom Come Deliverance. But this game does feature it. It's just very limited and very, very inconsistent. Compared to a game like Red Dead Redemption 2, it feels very poorly executed. Whereas in Red Dead Redemption 2, if you shoot someone in the head with a shotgun, their head explodes in a very satisfying mess. In this game, 9 times out of 10, they get a small hole with a little bit of blood, and then they just fall down. Very occasionally, their head will come clean off or explode. The dismemberment works pretty well with bladed melee weapons, so if you get a swing anywhere near their neck, their head will just pop off, which is pretty cool. And of course, if you toss a grenade right under someone, there's a good chance it will blow their arms and legs and head off, leaving a bloody mess of limbs and guts. But as far as a dynamic, unique reaction to specific ballistic damage goes, Cyberpunk is well behind the curve. The cybernetics are fun. They all work pretty well and enhance the game in their own ways. Personally, the double jump upgrade is my number one most important, followed closely by Gorilla Arms. But there really are so many that can change the way you play the whole game and they do really make it so you can do things almost whatever way you want. There are mods to make time slow down in different situations, and one to give you a blast radius for jumping from a certain height, and of course there are passive boost mods that give you more armor or health or RAM. So lots of other things that can drastically change gameplay. So honestly, other than the complaint that even if you have titanium skeleton, you still take falling damage for some reason, I love the cybernetic system in this game. Body physics are not ideal. When you shoot someone, they usually just slump down. If you throw them in the water, they plummet straight to the bottom and lie like a mannequin. If you want to throw someone off a building, they kind of slide down like a sack of liquid. But when they hit the ground, they kind of just bounce like a beanie bag toy. Honestly, they feel like they are weighted all wrong. If you stand right next to someone and blast them with a sniper rifle or a shotgun, they usually just kind of tip forward and fall down, usually without bending their limbs. When I shoot someone in the chest with a shotgun point blank, I want to see a Quentin Tarantino style splatter, followed by a rapid reverse acceleration with the optional backflip or Wilhelm scream. In short, combat should be an event all in itself, and not just a way to loot hot dogs and handguns off dead mannequins. Now I don't want to make it sound like the combat is terrible, because honestly it isn't. I find that running around and slicing all of your enemies up with a katana is very fun for the most part, especially if you focus on the right skills to make it feel like you're an android Jedi samurai that slices through your enemies like Drax through Sakaarans. The sniper rifles feel heavy and powerful, like you could kill a transformer with one, so those are honestly pretty fun as well. And when the dismemberment and gore works, shotguns and powerful handguns are also pretty fun to use in cl close combat. So it certainly does have its good points. Map navigation is alright. The city feels very dense because there are lots of buildings with multiple occupiable stories. And there are areas where there is a ceiling, so it feels like you can't go up. Which offers a sense of claustrophobia in a lot of the slummier areas. Which I think adds to the immersion. The whole world is technically open cell, so there are no load screens when entering a building or going up in a building. However, if you jump off the building, you die. And there is no way to fly, so short of slowly parkouring your way up the side of a mega building or an overpass, the verticality is mostly meaningless. Unless you're trying to find something, then it's just annoying. I also find that given how much of the story for each area happens in a cluster for each burrow, cars are not super important gameplay wise unless you're in the Badlands. And even if you do have to go a long way, the streets are packed with tons of cars all going the same speed and always getting in your way. And of course, suicidal pedestrians that will try their damnedest to get in front of your vehicle whenever possible. So while it's pretty easy to get around, and at the best of times it can be enjoyable, a lot of the time I would describe the map navigation as annoying. That being said, they did include an extensive fast travel system that is pretty convenient for most situations. So if you don't want to deal with all the negative stuff I was just talking about, you can of course just fast travel. 
For total features available in this game and what systems they have in place, I give Cyberpunk a 5 out of 10. The day and night and weather cycle are very limited and don't really change much at all, especially in a city where the nights are just as bright given how many lights there are. Not to mention there are so many people walking around at night you would think it was still rush hour. If I was going to rate how well the implemented systems work, I would say 7 out of 10. The hitboxes can be a bit strange at times, and there are all the flaws I mentioned, but the combat is in most ways a fully functioning system with almost limitless ways to approach every scenario. And as far as the game physics go, I would honestly say 4 out of 10. Most of the systems in this game feel wildly inconsistent at the best of times, and horrendously immersion breaking at the worst of times. And given that games like Red Dead Redemption 2, which came out two years ago, do most of these things way better, I was not very impressed with Cyberpunk's physics. So my composite score for gameplay is a 5.33, repeating, out of 10. So moving on to our next section, given that this game was marketed as a role-playing game and that it is an adaptation of a tabletop RPG, it makes sense that the RPG elements would be part of this discussion. This is an interesting topic, as most people agree, that even though The Witcher 3 is a nearly flawless game, it is not by most definitions an RPG, as most of the choices you will make and customization that you can do is really all surface level, and the game will still play very similarly no matter what you do. So Cyberpunk 2077 is really CD Projekt Red's first proper RPG, and honestly I think this is one of their strengths. For starters, there are the different backgrounds that you choose at the start of the game which shape your whole first act, as well as your speech options throughout the game. Then, there is the fact that you can choose your gender and voice, which again will make a difference when it comes to who you can romance, and how people will react to some things that you say or do. Interestingly, you can choose and, to a certain extent, customize your genital. However, I have found that this makes absolutely no gameplay difference and is entirely just for you. So I think it's a pointless addition. For example, if you want to romance River Ward, a male character in the game, you must have the feminine voice and body type. However, if your feminine sounding and looking V also happens to be sporting a male member, he's still down for the swirl. So to me, this feels like a pointless addition that could have been handled much better. Similarly, you can totally customize your face and hair but you very rarely see yourself. Short of looking at yourself in the menu, or in the mirror, or the like four cutscenes in the game, you're always in first person mode, so it doesn't make much of a difference. Don't get me wrong, I actually prefer to play role playing games in first person mode most of the time, as I find it more immersive, but my favorite games are those that allow you to switch between perspectives, so you can look at yourself if you want to. This also makes the clothing system mostly pointless. As, at least as far as looks go. So most of the time I just use whatever has the best stats and throw aesthetics to the wind. Arguably the worst RPG related problem with Cyberpunk 2077 is the fact that no matter what you look like, no matter what you wear, and no matter what you do, the world does not react to you. You can walk around stark naked and people will talk to you as if it's nothing out of the ordinary. You can show up to a gang meeting wearing the most expensive clothing in the game, and it will play out no different than showing up in shorts and a tank top with no shoes on. There is no charisma effect, no intimidation factor, no status flaunting, nothing. This, once again, diminishes the importance of caring about what you look like or wear. However, where the game does shine is the skills and attribute system. Cyberpunk has a nearly perfect leveling system that both allows you to fully customize your character for the playstyle you want, as well as preventing you from being an unstoppable Mary Sue who is the top of his or her field in every single field. There are only 5 attributes and 12 skills, each corresponding to the appropriate attribute. The attributes are self-explanatory, and leveling them up allows you to improve those skills and unlock new abilities and gain passive boosts in some instances. Altogether, this means that if you plan it out, you can customize your character to fit perfectly into your desired playstyle. However, this system is balanced by a level cap of 50, which means that there is a finite amount of attribute points that you can earn, so you can't max out every single attribute. So, if you level up intelligence all the way to get better at hacking, you may have to sacrifice your brute strength. Much like in real life, if you spend all of your time working out and practicing gunplay, you can't exactly also spend all of your time reading and doing research. This sense of finite ability points makes each one important. There is a system to respec your skill points, but it is pretty expensive, so it's not something you will do a lot. There is not, however, a way to respec your attribute points, so choose wisely. Personally, I like this system, 
Because although I enjoy games like Skyrim, Kingdom Come Deliverance, Fallout 4, or The Witcher 3, none of them made every single skill choice as important and impactful as they are in Cyberpunk 2077. All of this being considered, this is not a very sandbox game. And I think that the extreme lack of sandbox elements is more than a little immersion breaking. I'm not saying that Cyberpunk should have a Fallout 4 style settlement crafting system where you can build whatever you want and start a community, because that would not make any sense in this game. However, if you play the game like I do, you will scrape together a lot of cash over the playthrough. To me, it doesn't make any sense that you have no housing option but to spend the whole game with your house being the same apartment in the same crappy building that you start out in as some poor unknown Although systems like this don't make a huge difference gameplay-wise, they are value-of-life systems that make the game feel more immersive. The game does feature one such system, which is the weapon display shelves in your closet, that are very reminiscent of the old Hitman game where you could put all your weapons up in a gardening shed wall. So for appearance customization, I have to give it a 6 out of 10. You can make yourself look like whatever you want, you can choose your gender and even your genitals, but it makes no gameplay difference and you almost never see it. So it's a shallow feature that I find makes little to no difference. As for skills and leveling, I give it a 10 out of 10. It is easily one of the best games in that department I have ever played. The choices are all meaningful and can drastically change the way that the game plays, making it feel like your character actually is personalized. And unlike some games like Skyrim, it is not an overcomplicated system. So while you have this extremely good level of customization, it's also very simple, which is perfect. Finally, for effect on the world around you, it's gotta be a five out of 10 for me. You can clean up the streets by taking out criminals, but it makes no real difference. What you wear has no effect on dialogue or NPC reaction or interaction. And you can't buy or build anything special in the game outside of weapons and cars, no matter how rich you get. So my average for RPG elements is 7 out of 10. So the last area that I want to discuss is graphics. And for this section, I think it's important to point out the system I experienced the game on, which is PC, as that has made a huge difference as far as people's experiences have gone. I have a pretty good PC. It's an RTX 2080 Ti i9-9900K combo with a 2TB M.2 SSD, which I keep the game on, and 32GB of RAM. I've got a top-notch high-end air cooler and optimized airflow in a really good case. All of this means that it runs most games very, very well. And for starters, this game does not make it any more of a space heater on the highest settings than Kingdom Come Deliverance or Red Dead Redemption 2. I have very stable and high frame rates all around the map at all times, and I've never noticed any stuttering or even momentary frame rate drops. So performance-wise, this game runs very well on my system. Additionally, I have not experienced a single crash in the entire 120 hours I've played so far, even with multiple other programs running and running other stuff on my second monitor. So on PC, especially higher-end PCs, this game runs very well. As far as specific specs go, I have been in contact with a lot of other people playing this game on PC, and their experiences have been very similar to mine. The lowest end PC being a 1070 Ti and i5-8400 combo, which ran the game very well on high settings and never experienced any major frame rate drops or game crashes. So despite some stories to the contrary, it does not need to be a super high end PC to run very well. It seems to run pretty well on most modern PCs, so this experience should be relatively consistent as far as computers go. Of course, it should be noted that this does not hold true for consoles, especially last-gen consoles. The game looks pretty bad on PS4 and Xbox, and performs even worse. Similarly, apparently on the PS5, it crashes every 30 minutes or so for most people. In fact, there were so many issues and reports that Sony pulled it from their store and started issuing refunds, something that is pretty much unheard of in the gaming world. In short, if you want to play Cyberpunk 2077 on a console right now, you better own an Xbox Series X. And then you should still temper your expectations because it doesn't appear to be very well optimized for consoles. With all of this in mind, when you have the right hardware, the game does look pretty dang good. It takes advantage of modern ray tasting abilities and has excellent graphic fidelity in nearly all aspects. The game looks very, very good for the most part. If I was going to nitpick, I would say I'm not blown away by the water in the game, but that's not a huge deal because there isn't a lot of water in the game anyway and the NPC models are nothing too impressive. To keep things simple, I'm going to be rating this section for PC, so bear in mind that it would probably be much, much lower if I was rating it for consoles. 
As far as performance goes, I give it an 8 out of 10. It works really well on PC. And aside from some pretty minor bugs, the game plays very well on mid-range to high-end PCs, as long as you have your graphic settings at an appropriate level. As far as graphical fidelity goes, I give it a 7 out of 10. Most everything looks good. There are some stunning things to look at and some that are markedly less impressive, but nothing looks particularly half-assed or massively out of date. So for this section, I give the game a 7.5 out of 10. So you may have noticed that I didn't discuss the many controversies out there or the lot of reported bugs for this game. This is for a few reasons, the first of which being I based the vast majority of this review off of my own experience. I'm not one to pile on the bandwagon, and my experience with this game has been very good, especially considering I started playing it on day one, and have experienced very few glitches, and none of them were meaningful in any way. When compared to many other large open world game launches, this one was very well polished at launch, admittedly only on PC, but that is clearly what the game was most well optimized for. I do, however, now want to take a moment to discuss what went wrong with this game, as that has become the top of the discussion for this game due to the myriad of problems people have been having with it. The first area is technical problems. For people playing on the PS4 or the X-Bone, the game sucks. It is almost unplayable, it looks terrible, and it runs very poorly. The current generation of consoles runs the game better, but not 4K 60fps stable and the PS5 still suffers the regular crash problem. So this is a very real problem for a lot of people out there. There are a ton of people pointing the finger for blame on this. There are, of course, the people saying it's the devs' fault, and a lot more people saying it's management's fault. Then there are a lot of people blaming Microsoft and Sony for not properly vetting the game before approving it for their consoles. Personally, I believe the blame belongs at least a little bit in the all of the above category as is true with nearly every situation ever. And if we are all being honest with ourselves, the answer here is very, very simple. It was incredibly stupid to launch the game at all on last-gen consoles. Sure, they made a lot of sales this way, but it was not worth the bad publicity and the reputation damage. They waited so long with the game that new consoles were going to be out already when it was launched. So this title should have only been wor uh, worked on for PC, Xbox Series X, and PS5. This would have given the team more time to polish the game and make sure it actually works on each system. Because from a hardware standpoint, the PS4 and X-Bone don't even come close. It should have never been available on the PS4 or the Xbox One. And this shouldn't really surprise anyone, especially experts in the gaming industry, because when the PS4 and Xbox One came out, by PC standards, the hardware was already three or four years out of date. And that was, what, seven years ago? So it shouldn't be too surprising that it struggles to play a game that, you know, stretches the new system's legs. And the second reason a lot of people are hating on this game right now is mostly their own fault. I know that may sound harsh, but it really is. Cyberpunk 2077 is a victim of, a, of ridiculous amounts of overhyping. For nearly eight years, countless people have been frothing at the mouth for this game, insisting that it would be the game of the new decade, and set a new gold standard for gaming. But there was never any real evidence that this was going to be the case. Sure, The Witcher 3 is the gold standard. However, that game had the advantage of taking place in an existing world, with well-developed lore, characters, and honestly a way better setting. It's an ample and oranges comparison. I went into this game with literally no expectations. I knew nothing about the world, other than it was vaguely futuristic and slightly dystopian. I knew nothing about the story. I had no connection to anyone in it. All I knew was that it was an open-world, story-driven action RPG made by CD Projekt Red. And because I went into it with realistic expectations, it met or exceeded all of them. Gamers have a problem with setting realistic expectations for games, especially when they are announced way too early such as this game. And then, thanks to an aggressive ad campaign in the year leading up to the release, and the inclusion of a big name in Keanu Reeves, what was already unsustainable levels of hype became unheard of. Even if the industry average is a 5 out of 10, and then you get a 7 out of 10 when you were expecting an 11 out of 10, you're going to be disappointed. So in conclusion, in my opinion, and based on my not inextensive experience with this and other games, I rate Cyberpunk 2077 a 6 out of 10 for story, a 5.33 out of 10 for gameplay, a 7 out of 10 for RPG elements, and a 7.5 out of 10 for graphics. All said and done, this game is a solid 6.5 or 7 out of 10. Above average to pretty good. Not a new gold standard, not the future of gaming, 
but also not a terrible dumpster fire like some people have been claiming. My experience with the game has been mostly positive. I've gotten more than my money's worth out of it, and I will likely play it again at some point in the future, especially if it gets some good single player DLC like The Witcher 3 did. Is it worth buying? Only if you have the hardware it plays well on, or if they continue to patch it to the point where it's playable on all systems. Should you get it if you don't like semi-futuristic GTA clones crossed with first-person shooters? Probably not. I think CD Projekt Red has a lot of work ahead of them to deliver on some of their promises and rebuild their reputation, but for me, the game delivered. But that's just my opinion, and I would love to hear yours. So if you would be so kind as to share your thoughts either by liking or disliking, or sharing them in detail down in the comment section, I would be more than happy to read them. But in any case, thanks for watching, and have a nice day, and I'll see you next time. Thanks for watching another Dare to Game video. If you like this video, please leave a like and a comment. If you haven't already, be sure to subscribe to the channel. If you like my content and would like to support this channel, consider becoming a member today for as little as $1.99 a month. It makes a huge difference. But in any case, thanks for watching and have a nice day. I'll see you next time.